Swedish music writer and ABBA fanatic Carl Magnus Palm has been updating his book on the songwriting style of Benny and Björn, who created some of the biggest hits in pop music history. And this week marks the 40th anniversary since Knowing Me, Knowing You, aha, went to number one in the charts for five weeks in the UK. Well, Carl's book, The Complete Recording Sessions, has looked at why they were able to produce one hit after another. And here he is explaining what he's been researching. Going through the whole process, from writing a song for, and then recording it, they were recording the vocals with you know, Agnette and Frida's ma magnificent vocals, uh, doing further overdubbing and then mixing and everything. So, so that's what I've been sort of trying to find out. How did they do it? How did they create uh, those amazing recordings? And, and what is it particularly different to how other pop groups work or are there differences there? I think it can be boiled down to one thing, and that is that they really took their time, especially if you compare with other pop groups at the time. You know, if you, you, you look at rock acts, they would be more, or say prog rock acts, for instance, at the time, they would be more prone to spending hours and hours and hours in the studio, whereas pop groups, they just went in and they dashed it off mm. and hopefully it became a hit. Whereas ABBA, they took their pop music very, very seriously. You know, uh, even a song like Mamma Mia or, you know, Dancing Queen, for instance, that, that I mean, they, they worked on that one for months until they were really happy with it and only mm. then would they release it. Um, and was that because Benny and Beyond were real or are real perfectionists? Indeed, yes. Um, they were always very, very ambitious, and uh, they 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 wanted things to be really perfect, as you say, um, without losing obviously the feeling. They always wanted. They didn't want to get rid of the feeling. That always had to be there. You had to communicate emotionally with the listener, but uh, that was part of the perfection in their view. Now uh, you published this uh, this this book. You published this book some years ago, and you've been updating it. What have you um, been looking at particularly, and how have you found it out? Well, briefly, uh, when I w wrote the first book, everything was in analog format. You know, like uh, regular old tapes. Um, reel to reel tapes, whereas since then everything has been transferred to a digital format. Mm, of course, yeah. Yeah, so at the time, you know, back in the 90s when I did the first day of the book, I couldn't, I, you know, I could listen to like 5% of everything that I want to <laughs> listen to in terms of outtakes and alternate mixes and stuff like that. But now because everything is digital, you only have to press a button, it doesn't, it doesn't cost any money, you don't have to hire a recording studio to listen to it, so you can just sit on a chair anywhere really. And, um, so what I found was, uh, you know, I found proof of how they would work with one and the same song, trying out different arrangements, idea, arrangement ideas, removing those, trying something new, um, and then just until they were completely satisfied. I mean, a song like Waterloo, you would think that would be pretty straightforward, right? But I think I found... Uh, was it 25 different mixes or mix attempts, you know? Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, they worked on that forever. Accessible are these tapes and these recordings? They're accessible if you get permission to listen to them. And I was fortunate enough to get permission from from Bjorn and Benny. They they said, okay, you can listen to this if you want to. So I was sat in the room at the record company, and all these mixes had been burned on reference discs like CDs. So you just popped a CD into the CD player and, mm. and started listening. Were they there when you were listening? They were not. Okay. Uh, I don't think they they were interested. I did spend, when I wrote the, the first book, I did spend a day with Bjorn and Benny and their invaluable sound engineer, Michael Tretto, who was like the fifth member of ABBA in musical terms. Um, we spent a day at uh, Michael's home studio listening to outtakes at the time, which 
I still think is one of the greatest days in my life, <laughs> at least my professional life. It was just magic, you know, to be together with them and rediscovering old songs that they'd forgotten about. You know. It was your wedding day. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, how long have you loved ABBA for? Um, I wasn't really much of an ABBA fan back in the 70s. What? No, no. Uh, it, this came later to me. Uh, it was, uh, you know... Uh, the typical latecomer. When uh, when ABBA were about to break up, that's when I really got into them for real. Um, so and this whole thing about researching ABBA and writing about them um, that began in uh, in say the early nineties. Um, so so mm. yeah. So it's been going on for a while now. You know, it's what is it, twenty five, twenty seven years or something? Yeah. yeah. And and the legend continues because I know in Stockholm they've got a hotel, haven't they? Yeah, um, Benny owns a hotel and Bjorn part owns a hotel, but but specifically they have the the museum. The museum, uh, yes. Uh, the museum, which is which is quite new, I think. Yes, it opened. Um, what is it? Four years ago, or something, and they've already had more than a million visitors over <laughs> those four years. So it's just just it just goes on, doesn't it, with ABBA? Oh my word! I have to come to Stockholm and go there. And you also, should. also, I thought there was um, there was somewhere that you went, and correct me this, if this is wrong, and you rang a phone and a member of ABBA may or may not pick it up. That is uh, the museum. <laughs> yes, they have a they have a telephone there. So if it if it rings, it's it, it is one of the ABBA members. I'm not sure how many times it actually has rung since they opened, but uh, <laughs> but from time to time it has, and and you know a surprised visitor gets to talk to Agneta or Benny or whoever. Yeah. I wonder if Agneta never picks up. <laughs> um, she, yeah, exactly. She, she, she I, had I a bit of a comeback recently, didn't she? Yeah, she did. She did that album uh, called A, which was out um, about four years ago. And, uh, you know, because she has this reputation of being uh, a bit reclusive and stuff, which isn't true, actually, because she's <laughs> out and about, she goes to parties and stuff. <clears throat> it's just that um, in recent decades, she hasn't been so interested in being uh, a public figure and all of that but for this album she really stepped out didn't she she came mm. to london she did yeah. all these radio shows and television she didn't do uh, mine no well <laughs> hey It's funny that this suspicion persisted that she was a recluse, and yet, like you say, and I think I'd read quite a bit that, she, you know, she used to be seen out and about. It was just that she was not in a pop group anymore, and she wasn't hugely famous all over the world. Exactly. She, um, she just decided to, you know, that she'd had enough of being a public figure. I think it became a bit too much for her, really. I'm sure. So, so she just decided to devote herself to private matters, and then... Um, four years ago, these guys came with her, or five years ago, these guys came to her uh, and said, you know, we have a bunch of songs here which we'd like you to record. Would, would you have a listen? And she listened to them and she said, well, these songs are great. Yeah, of course I'll make an album. So it's it wasn't like a, a very difficult decision for her. It's just, okay, the right, the right songs, the right opportunity, and she did it. Yeah, and actually when I've seen her interviewed, um, she seems quite shy anyway. Yeah, I think she is. I think all four of them are shy yeah. in a way. Even um, though Benny and Bjorn have really kind of gone beyond, haven't they, with the musicals and Yeah, they they've I mean they've uh, they've continued with the music and Benny especially, you know, he sits every day uh you know of the week. He sits at the piano and plays. Does Never he? yeah, no day goes by with him uh, without him playing the piano. I'm nothing special. In fact, I'm a bit of a bore If I tell a joke You've probably heard it before But I have a talent A wonderful thing Cause everyone listens When I start to sing I'm so grateful and proud All I want is to sing it out loud So I say thank you for the music The songs I'm singing Thanks for all the joy they're bringing Who can live without it? I ask in honesty What would life be Without a song for this one of me? So I say 
that's what he does. He sits there and plays and plays and plays, you know, melody fragments in the hope that something will emerge that he thinks is good enough. And that's the way he's always worked. There's always talk of them reforming and having a comeback. And they did appear briefly, didn't they? Quite recently together. But yeah. But they didn't do anything. Exactly. They've done so, you know, uh, stood on, on, on a stage together side by side and, and uh, had pictures taken. But they haven't really performed together and they're not going to do that. It's, it's too late for that now because they want to preserve the memory of ABBA mm. as they were back then. You know, to ha not having done anything for 35 years and then come back as, you know, three 70-year-olds and one 67-year-old. That's not something they want to do. No. And... Um they may not even be speaking. Uh, to each other, you mean? Yeah. No, uh, they get on well. Uh, I know that for a fact. I mean, they're mm. not hanging out 24-7, but, uh, but they, they're good friends and they, their relationship is better than ever. Great to talk to you. Thank you so much, Carl. My pleasure. Uh, what's your favourite ABBA tune, by the way? Much appreciated. Now, um, we've been talking about international bands this morning, all inspired because this week is the 40th anniversary of this song starting a five-week run at number one. ABBA's Knowing Me, Knowing You. Aha! Five weeks at number one, 40 years ago. No. Now, some people initially dismiss the Eurovision winners as nothing more than that, just Eurovision winners. But in the years that follow, industry experts have analysed their songs and found depth and complexity to their music. Now, one man who's been absolutely fascinated by ABBA is Carl Magnus Palm. And through his research and interviews with the band, he's written a book which reveals ABBA's secrets in the recording studio. The book also tells the stories of how Agnetha, Bjorn, Benny and Frida approach their work and what they feel about the songs they recorded way back when. Uh, and it's not all, it's not all positive. Uh, let's speak to Carl. He's, he's Carl Magnus Palm. He's with us now. Carl, good morning. Good morning. So they, they don't look... Well, they fell out a lot, didn't they? So that's one thing. But, I mean, they don't look back on all of their music with positivity. That's a shock, a surprise, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think I like more ABBA songs than they do, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, think, I think people listen to this. Everyone's got a favourite ABBA song, haven't they? Uh, oh, yeah, oh, yes, of course, of course. But, they, you know, uh, they put out this uh, compilation album called ABBA Gold, which is a huge success, and it's the second best-selling album of all time in this country, for instance. Well, Bjorn and Benny of ABBA, they, they keep telling the record company that they should put out a compilation album called ABBA Wood, <laughs> uh, which which uh, would include the worst ABBA tracks. What, what, um, do, what don't they like? Um, it's mainly the early songs, some, some songs when they try to be a rock band. On the Waterloo album, for, for instance, there's a song called Watch Out, which they absolutely detest and they, uh, they're just so embarrassed by it because they, you know, they say, oh, we tried, we tried to be a rock band and we should never have tried that. We were a pop band and why, you know, we were stupid to even attempt that. But that's a surefire inclusion for, for Abba Wood. And there's another song on that album called Abba King Wood. Kong Song. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> and on the following album, the one called uh, ABBA, you know, the one that has Mamma Mia and SOS on it. Oh, I love those uh, this songs. Is, yeah, the, and, but there's a song there called Hey Hey Helen, which for some reason I don't understand really, that they just also dislike. They, so we, we should never have recorded that, yeah, put yeah, that on you, ABBA Wood. <laughs> you call them a pop band. I mean, uh, you know, I watched a documentary a few years ago, and they, they were more of a folk band, really. When they took folk tunes, didn't they, and poppified them, essentially, didn't they? Yeah, in a way they did, because their influences came from all over the world, didn't it? I mean, they, they, they were huge fans of the Beach Boys and the Beatles and whoever else was around, you know, the modern pop muse, pop and rock music. But they were also fans of Swedish folk music and folk music from other countries as well. And classical music, you know, Benny's a huge classical music fan and European easy listening pop and stuff like that. So they, they took all those influences and, and married it together. And that that's that's why they could create something unique. That's why they could stand out from other pop groups at the time. There's so many hits as well. And, and you mentioned in the book about the secrets of the recording studio. Come on, let us into a couple. How, how did they get the hooks and the lines? And why? How did they keep us buying these songs over and over again? 
Well, the secret is that they worked so hard on each and every song. You know, someone said uh, th that the secret of ABBA's success was, was that they worked harder than anyone else. Uh, and that was all there was to it. They could, uh, even at the writing stage, you know, Bjorn and Benny would get together with a, an acoustic guitar and a piano and just sit there and throw melody fragments at each other. And they could work for you know, for a week on one and the same song because the verse should be strong they and the chorus they they didn't just put all their money on the chorus the verse had to be strong as well the chorus had to be strong everything that was going on, every little melody line had to be solid before they were ha really happy with it and once they had that song they were for weeks in the studio on that song again um you know, Benny was uh, was like a manic overdubber, if you will. <laughs> uh, th their sound engineer, Michael Tretto, who was like the fifth ABBA member in the recording studio, he was, you know, he was pulling his hair out by the roots because of this frustration because Benny wanted to do overdub and after overdub after overdub on this multi-track tape. And, you mm. know, 24 tracks, that sounds a lot, but they would run out. And uh, you know, we hear <laughs> so he's singing the same thing and, and putting the same thing over each over itself more than twenty four times. Yeah, wow. or or you know, could could add like a, a riff. You know, Benny yeah. had oh, you know, I, I want to do this melody line, and I have another. You know, these chords, I want to play them as well. So he had to sort of. He had to sort of, uh, Michael, the engineer, he had to assemble, uh, mix down several things on one track to free up tracks for Benny to do his overdub. So they were at it for, for hours. They were geeks, really, weren't they? I mean, just absolute perfectionists. Yeah, oh yeah. P perfection perfection is, is like, uh, th that was what they were searching for, what they were aiming for. Is that why they but fell out so much? Is that, because there was, there was so much intensity around all that. Yeah, they they were, but they 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 say that they those marriages would have ended even if ABBA hadn't existed because mm. they just grew apart as people really more than more than. But of course, there, there were fiery scenes in the studio because Bjorn and Benny they were always at it with with uh, they were always demanding the impossible from Magneto and Frida, saying, "Oh, could you sing that an octave higher? Oh, I can't sing this an octave higher. Why are you asking me to me to do this? Oh, but please try." you know so there were really all these conflicts going on but they not, not conducive to a long and happy marriage all of that is it really no no no, no. no. Uh, but 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 uh, at the same time they also said well you know it's it's good if there's a a bit of energy in the studio a bit of anger in the studio because it helps the performance it gives the, the you know that little extra thing uh, that they were searching for that that came as a as, as a result of that yeah bob just picked me up on the pronunciation of agnetta i called it agnetha of course as, as many people do uh, he <laughs> yeah. says i'm not saying that because my wife is swedish but we are off there next week says bob in st nears no fair enough you know fair enough uh, and, and in terms of of, of present day because th this book you know tells the story of of how they approached their work and, and what went on in the studio and those little secrets and uh, but in, t in terms of today because you've spoken to them all haven't you i mean are, are they friends today do they get on today they do indeed actually um uh, you know after the divorces and after abba maybe there were a number of years where they didn't really want to have to do that much with each other and mm. they were trying to build their new lives but these days they're all friendly it's, it's not like they're hanging out very much but but they get together from time to time they have meetings to decide things about abba they go to parties together and stuff like that so they, 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 there's no animosity they're just really good friends mm. and they they share this memory they're never going to stand on stage again together, though, are they? I mean, that, that is the, the impossible dream, isn't it, for ABBA fans, you know? Yeah, that's never going to happen. They want people to remember them as they were back then, you know, in the 70s, when they were young and fresh, and not as four 70-year-olds. They, yeah. they don't want to they, they don't want to spoil the image. Well, listen, uh, good luck with the book. I hope it goes well. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave this interview with my favourite ABBA song. You ready? I love this song. Ah, yeah, great choice. God bless you, my friend. That's Carl Magnus Palm. He's written a book which reveals ABBA's recording secrets. Now, yesterday on the Mystery Year, we played you Knowing Me, Knowing You, which was the number one single uh, from this week in 1977 because uh, we did 77 as uh, the Mystery Year yesterday. It was the start of a five-week run at number one. Uh, and uh, we're here to talk about ABBA today with somebody who I think it's fair to say is an ABBA fan. Would you be a super fan, Carl? 
I think that would be an appropriate tag, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I admit, guilty, guilty as charged. <laughs> Carl Magnus yeah. Palm is with us. Uh, now, Carl's written a book all about ABBA, obviously, and the thing that interests me, Carl, is it reveals ABBA's recording secrets. Yes, it does. It's it's all about how they created their music uh, from from uh, from just starting to write the song and then uh, recording uh, with you know the backing track with the musicians, the vocals and everything. And you you get taken through each and every song in, in that process basically. And we 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 think a lot about ABBA. They you know I'm, I'm this is from my point of view. Bjorn and Benny do all the legwork in the studio uh, with the musicians and everything, and the girls do all the singing and look pretty out the front. Is that how it is? That's pretty accurate, actually. I mean, the girls, it, it, it wasn't like they were mere puppets and they just came to the studio and did as they were told. They had input. They had ideas for backing vocal harmonies and, uh, you know, counter melodies and stuff they could sing. Or maybe, I, you know, I could try to sing a bit like Eartha Kitt or I could try to, if I sing it like Connie Francis would, maybe that would be a good idea. So they had input. But obviously, like you say, Bjorn and Benny were the, the backbone of ABBA. They wrote the music. They produced it and they played on on the backing tracks and everything. So yeah, I think it says in your book that um, sometimes the way they recorded, everybody wasn't happy with the whole situation. Can you explain a bit more about that? Um, I'm not uh, the situation is such. Well, you mean like vocal overdubs and stuff like that? Yeah, um, just the way that the way that it, they approach their work. Yeah, uh, what happened was that w w when the girls came to the studio to to do the vocal overdubs, uh, Bjorn and Benny were they were quite hard taskmasters, and the, and then uh, they, they tried to get them to sing higher and higher and higher, like oh, could you do that an octave higher, perhaps? And they were like, "What the hell are you asking me to do it an octave higher? I can't possibly do that." Blah blah blah, you know. So, and like Frida told me, you know, she said that. Uh, when you're couples like we were, maybe you're a bit more open-hearted about your, what you feel than you would have been otherwise, which was her diplomatic way of, of sort of saying that, you know, the sparks would fly sometimes because they would get so, the girls would get so annoyed with the boys and their constant demands of them, the girls providing vocals that were almost impossible. They, but they weren't impossible. They pushed them and pushed them and pushed them and they could reach those high notes if they really tried. And that gave the song so much energy, didn't it? Yeah. And, uh, no, you spoke to band members and other people involved in the recording process for this book, didn't you? Yes, I did. I did indeed. Um, uh, this is like a revised and seriously <laughs> revised and expanded version of a book I wrote in the 90s originally. And that's when I did my main interviews with, with the four members. And um, they were happy to, to talk to me because it was all about the music. It wasn't about the divorces and stuff like that. It was just, just the, their creativity and their emotional commitment to their music. Uh, now, you've written about ABBA, I think, for 25 years or so now. W what made you a fan in the first place? Why did, I'm going to use the O word. Why did you come so, become so obsessed with them, Carl? Well, that's in my nature, I think. I, I, I love taking a subject and just uh, digging deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and to, to see what I find. Um, and I think with, with ABBA, it was such a challenge because uh, regard, if, you, if you compare them with other legendary bands, legendary acts, if you will, like the Beatles, like Bob Dylan, like Elvis, there were tons of books written about them and they were sort of discussed and analysed from every conceivable angle. With ABBA, they were sort of dismissed as this bubblegum pop group, which, you know, okay, they were skillful at what they did, but they, you know, have no real worth beyond that. And that to me was a challenge, you know, let's have a look at this, let's see if this is really true, let's see if there is more depth there than you think, and I, I think I've been proven right in that. When you were writing the book originally, you said you spoke to all four of the members, you listened to some of the recordings as well, didn't you, some unreleased material? I have indeed, yes, I, uh, I you know, it's been incred an incredible experience. 
Uh, I spent one day with Bjorn and Benny and their sound engineer, Michael Tretter, who was like the fifth member of ABBA. We spent one day together listening to Unreal's tracks, things that they hadn't heard for decades and maybe had forgotten about. And that was, you know, what one of the greatest days of my life, professionally speaking at least, was incredible. Since then, I've listened to more alternate mixes so you can sort of trace how the songs evolved. Songs like Dancing Queen, which they worked on for months and they did several mixes and they tried this and they, they tried that. What were the early um, mixes like, Carl? They were very bare bones and often very much longer, you know. They like to edit down their tracks much more than I thought, you know. Uh, I think Dancing Queen is, what is it, five or six minutes in its, in its original length and they took out bits from it when they felt it was standing still. It was, oh, this is boring, you know. Uh, let's take this out so that it moves forward. Let's move this verse from that place to this place to make it more, to make it, uh, so that it makes more sense. Things like that it's just incredible stuff they were quite complex as well weren't they because they were quite orchestral with their backing oh absolutely they were always trying to find ways to make the 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 song more interesting their sound engineer michael michael tretto he would you know he would uh, tear his hair out from the roost of frustration because benny would always want to add another overdub and another overdub and another overdub and you know they had 24 tracks on this multi-track tape to record everything on and that sounds like a lot but let me tell you those tracks disappeared quicker than you'd think and michael had to mix down you know take three tracks and mix them down on one track to free up tracks for benny because benny would never let go there was always a new idea he wanted to try all right well look it's been great to talk to you um the book is called just tell us remind us what it's called and when it's available uh it's called i think we've lost him it's called i think i can tell you what it's called it's carl magnus palm uh, and the book is called uh, the new edition of abba the complete recording sessions uh, and uh, that is available now if you'd like to get yourself uh, a copy of that uh, sounds absolutely fascinating doesn't it uh, right it's uh, just gone uh, 25 to 12 we've got an angel eyes on bbc radio cloth this should say 40 years since the start of the big five-week run for knowing me knowing you for abba Carl Magnus Palm's been fascinated by that group for a number of years now, and through his research and interviews with the band, he's written a book which reveals ABBA's recording secrets. It also tells the story of how Agneta, Bjorn, Benny and Frida approach their work and what they feel about the songs they recorded way back when, and they're not always completely positive. I've been speaking to Carl about uh, the group and how he got to know them and how his fascination with ABBA began. It began in the early 90s, to tell you the truth. I wasn't really an ABBA fan back in the in the 70s, but I really started getting getting into their music at the time. And uh, being a Beatles fan, I was in, you know, I'd read books about how they made their recordings, wrote the songs and everything. So I wanted to write a book about ABBA that dealt with the same thing, because I realized, you know, everyone loves their music and... Um, even the people who don't love their music or will always acknowledge that they were sort of masters of the recording studio and it was the, the craftsmanship was uh, impeccable. Um, so I thought, hey, there's a story there to be told. And uh, so that's when I wrote this book for the first time, ABBA The Complete Recording Sessions, which I've just uh, republished. It's interesting because ABBA, they weren't held. I mean, they are absolutely revered now, legends of the music industry and will be forevermore. There are some absolute timeless classics now. But obviously that wasn't always the case, was it? There were one or two who sort of perhaps turned their nose up at the music that ABBA produced. Yeah, I'd say there were a lot more than just one or two. Um, you know, at the time they they were regarded as, you know, superficial bubblegum group and they had nothing to say and they weren't... You know, when they were sort of uh, compared to progressive music acts, they was oh, their music is so simple and da-da-da, it's just Eurovision songs. And then when punk came along, oh, the, you know, they're suburbia, they're music for parents and young children, and the, 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 the cool thing is punk. So they were sort of always out of step, but... but the fact that they were so ambitious with their music, uh, they took their, you know, they, they, they never wanted to do anything uh, else than entertain with the music, create good music. The music came first and the lyrics, you know, came second. 
um, that's why people love them so much because people just re responded emotionally to them. Now I know for this new edition of the book, you, you've been talking to Benny and Bjorn and li listening to some of the uh, previously unheard recordings. How, how did you do that, and what did you hear? Um, well, I, I what happened was back in the nineties when I did the first book, everything was analog, so it was on reel to reel tapes, and if you wanted to listen to that, you had to hire a recording studio, and it was so expensive. Okay, so since then, the record company has transferred all the tapes in a digital format and they're all available on reference discs so you just have to pop them into a CD player and listen which costs nothing so I went to Benny and Bjorn and said hey you know uh, this book I did back in the 90s in which you collaborated on with me I'd like to do an update more details more stories and I'd like to listen to these uh, to all these reference discs and see what's on them are you okay with that and they said yes so what I found you know I found mainly I found alternate mixes so you could sort of trace an ABBA song from start to finish take a song like Dancing Queen for instance which sounds like it was always this perfect package from the start you know <laughs> Couldn't have been anything else. Yeah, like that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I had it ready to go. Um, <laughs> yeah. And if you heard that piano, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, which is so, that's so typical for Dancing Queen. That's the, the, that's the first thing you think of when you think of Dancing Queen. Well, that was only added at the last minute. There was the last thing they added to the mix after they'd done many, many mixes and tried this and tried that and edited the song down. And, you know, so they worked for, for months with some of these songs, definitely in the case of Dancing Queen. So it's just fascinating stuff. So it wasn't actually almost a perfect formula. There was, it was almost forensically deconstructed and then put back together again. Yeah, that, 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 that's pretty much it. You know, they uh, they were sort of the kings of the mixing desk. They would be sitting there trying, oh, let's do an overdub, overdub here. And, you know, Benny, he would never stop overdubbing. Michael Tretto, their uh, invaluable sound engineer, has told me, you know, that he was pulling his hair because Benny always wanted to do an another overdub and then another overdub and then another overdub until there were no tracks left on the tape, you know, and, and Michael had to do some magic to create to free up more tracks for Benny's overdubs. So so they were at it for hours and days and nights. They're not they're not completely positive about about some of the songs, are they? I mean it it, it sounds it, it's in contrast to the to the style of their music which is relentlessly cheerful. They they weren't particularly cheerful about some of them, were they? Yeah, when they, when they look back today, they say because you you know they had this very successful compilation album Abba Gold out, which has sold you know millions. I think it's the second best selling CD in this country, for instance, with Queen's Greatest Hits being number one. Anyway, so they keep telling the record company, hey, you should do a compilation called Abba Wood, with uh, with the, the worst Abba tracks, and it's mainly some of the early ones, album tracks from the Waterloo album, like Watch out and King Kong song if you're familiar with that and on the, the next album which was only called ABBA from 1975 the one that has Mamma Mia and SOS there's a song called Hey Hey Helen which they don't like and they keep bringing that up as an ABBA Wood candidate but you know even later songs like the big big hits like Gimme 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 for instance mm. Uh, Benny says that the only thing he likes is that intro, you know, the thing that Madonna sampled later. Yeah. That's the only thing he he thinks has any worth, and the rest of the track is, is rubbish. Very briefly, Carl, I've got to let you go, but I must ask you, I can't do an interview about ABBA without asking you, is there any possibility they'll ever come back together, or is that it? Will never happen. Why not? Um, because they want to preserve the memory of ABBA as they were back then in the 1970s. They don't want to come back as four 70-year-olds, you know. Carl Magnus Palmer, who knows them well. And you can think about it, everybody wants them. Well, it seems like everybody wants them to come back. But actually, frankly, if I had their money, would I be bothered to come? I don't think so. Nearly 25 past one, this is Lay All Your Love On Me. It's BBC Hereford and Worcester. Now, we all like a bit of ABBA, don't we? Mm? And this week, it's the 40th anniversary of the start of ABBA's five-week run at number one with Knowing Me, Knowing You. Now, some people dismissed the Eurovision winners as nothing more than, well, just that, really. But in the years that followed, industry experts have analysed their songs and found depth and complexity to ABBA's music. One man who's been fascinated by ABBA is Carl Magnus Palm.
and through his research and interviews with the band, he's written a book which reveals ABBA's recording secrets. Carl, hello. Hi there. We all love a bit of ABBA. We really, really do. But you're a man who's been fascinated with them forever and a day. Um, tell us a little bit about the, the secret ingredients. How did ABBA approach creating their music to the point that now it has really stood the test of time? Well, I think I think the the the, the big secret uh, is that they were so meticulous. They they started even at the songwriting stage. Bjorn and Benny would be sitting there with a with acoustic guitar and piano and just try melody fragments out. You know, oh, I thought of this this morning. What do you think? Oh, that's good. And if we put that together with that thing that you played just a minute ago, then we'll have a song and da da da. So they they were really working really hard on just putting together solid songs and not just putting uh, all their efforts on a catchy chorus but also creating good verses because the the song had to be solid then they brought that to the studio and they tried to re record one and the same song in various arrangements you know it could be a country the, oh let's try this as a country number no let's try it as a ballad no mm -hmm. let's try it as a disco number and so, so they, and then the girls came in to do the vocals once they had that backing track, instrumental backing track, and they worked really hard, layers and layers of vocals. And then after that, it was more overdubs. Um, Benny was like this uh, f fountain, is that the word, of mm. fountain of ideas? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> he just came, kept, kept coming up with uh, new ideas all the time for overdubs that he wanted to try out. So they worked for weeks on one of the, one of the, one and the same song. So that, that is the big secret, that they worked so hard and never gave up. It's incredible. And how did they feel about the songs that they recorded way back then? Because their, their response to them now with hindsight isn't always positive, is it? No, I mean, obviously, they are very proud of things like Dancing Queen and The Winner Takes It All and Knowing Me, Knowing You sure. and, and whatever. But there are some songs that they'd rather forget, let's put it that way. You know, Abba Gold, the, the you know, multi-million successful uh, compilation album, which I think is the biggest, uh, second biggest selling album in this country of all time. Mm. Um, Bjorn and Benny keep telling the record company that they should put out Abba Wood, with uh, with uh, Abba's worst tracks, and uh, among them are mainly some early rockers. There's a song called "Watch Out" on Abba's album, uh, the, the Waterloo album. Yes, and they always feel when they listen to that, oh, God, is, this is so <laughs> awful. We should never have tried to do rock music. We, was, we were never any good at that. Mm. There's another song called King Kong Song on that album. Sure. The following album has a song called Hey Hey Helen, which I don't understand why they dislike so much. I think it's great. Yeah. But for some reason, they think, you know, that belongs on Abba Wood. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you have all these ingredients, the formula of how to create an Abba song. Uh, what, what are the main steps then? This is the 40th anniversary of Abba's five-week run at number one with Knowing Me, Knowing You. What's the story behind that recording? Do you, do you, do you know how that one came about? They wrote it... Uh, I think out on an island, uh, they had there was an island in Sweden in the Stockholm archipelago called Vigsö, where they all had summer houses, and there was a songwriting cottage there as well, which belonged to Agneta and Björn's property was on on, uh, on their property, and uh, Björn and Benny would write songs there. They wrote Waterloo there, Ring Ring, uh, The Winner Takes It All, Dancing Queen, all these famous songs, and Knowing Me, Knowing You. And that would have started out just a, just as a tune with which they didn't know uh, what they were going to do with, really. Mm -hmm. And then they went to the studio and recorded it, the backing track, the girls came in, did their vocals, Frida did a magnificent lead vocal. And um, then uh, they, they actually, that song is much longer in its original state. It has a long introduction, which they removed. Um, from the recording, because that was always their principle, you know, okay, this song is treading water, it's not moving forward. They, there are so many ABBA songs where, which were edited down, which I discovered when I, when I wrote this book. I had no idea that they'd done so much butchering, <laughs> if you will, of, <laughs> of, of those songs. And of course the lyrics, it sort of looks forward, you know, the, about a couple splitting up and yes. the, the children, uh, you know, unhappy children and all that as a result of that. 
um, th- though, you know, people think of that, oh, it's one of Abba's classic divorce songs, they're singing about themselves, but actually that song was written two years before there were any divorces. However, Bjorn is, yeah, Bjorn has said, who wrote the lyrics, and said, well, okay, maybe, maybe there was a, a, pre- a bit of premonition there, maybe I sh- chose to write about that because I, somewhere deep inside of me, I knew this was going to happen sooner or later. Incredible. So it's kind of interesting, yeah. You're fascinating. I could talk to you all day. Carl, thank you so very much for talking to us. My pleasure. Thank you. No. Angel Eyes by ABBA. This week is the 40th anniversary of the start of ABBA's five-week run, number one, with Knowing Me, Knowing You. Now, some people dismiss the Eurovision winners as nothing more than that. But in the years that followed, industry experts have analysed their songs and they've found depth and complexity to their music. One man who's been fascinated by ABBA is Carl Magnus Palm. And through his research and interviews with the band, he's written a book which reveals ABBA's recording secrets. So when most Eurovision winners disappear without a trace, what was special about ABBA? Well, I I don't think they ever regarded themselves as a Eurovision act to start with. Uh, That Eurovision victory was the best thing that happened to them, but also the worst thing, because it's sort of put this uh, this label was affixed to them that uh, they were superficial and they were only you know here today gone tomorrow that kind of group but they were always very very serious about the music from the very start and they only became more serious so i think that's the that's the main difference especially eurovision groups back then they were oh wow we won great and they didn't expect any more for abba they always viewed it as a platform to take their music out to a wider audience and their music, more than just catchy tunes, although many of them are, but actually um, quite a, a depth in their music. Absolutely. Um, ABBA had this strange mix of the melancholy and the uplifting in, in one and the same song. I mean, like Knowing Me, Knowing You, for instance, that's a really sad story about a divorce and a family breaking up and, you know, children going to live with one of the parents and all that. And yet it sounds so very energetic, so uplifting through their performance. And for some reason, that kind of contrast really works. And I think that that, that's why why it reached people's hearts in the way that did. And of course, I mean, their personal lives, they had their ups and downs in their personal lives and and their own um, split ups. Did that really influence the music? Can you can you hear that in the music? It did indeed, especially in the later years, because the the split ups started happening in seventy eight, seventy nine, and there that, that was when Bjorn and Agneta split up, and then in eighty one, Benny and Frida uh, split up, and uh, yet they carried on as ABBA, they carried on working together, and uh, the winner takes it all. For instance, that's obviously the most famous song. It's not literally about their divorce, but if you uh, you know, symbolically, emotionally, it sort of explores the divorce. And Bjorn told me that when he brought the lyrics for that to the studio, which he had written, and uh, asked Anietta to sing them and she had a look at the lyrics, she started crying. Not because she thought, well, this is about me, this is a literal depiction of what happened in our re- relationship, but because she could sense the emotional truth in it. So, uh, you know, and there's a song called When All Is Said and Done on The, on the Visitors, uh, the next album, which deals, it, it was sort of, shall we say, inspired or it, it was triggered by uh, Benny and Frida split. And Frida told me that when she sang that song, she felt, okay, you know, this this song really sums up all my sadness, all my sorrow uh, after this break from Benny. Clearly, they're very passionate about the music, very professional. But did they like all of their own music? They didn't. I mean, back then, maybe they did. But in hindsight, Bjorn and Benny have been very scathing about some of the songs. So, uh, you know, Abba Gold, the, the compilation album, that's, you know, the second best-selling album of all time in this country. They keep telling the record company, Bjorn and Benny do, that they should put put out a compilation album called Abba Wood with uh, with Abba's worst track. <laughs> Uh, tracks. Uh, so there's there are some early tracks called. There's a rock song, for instance, called "Watch Out" on the on the Waterloo album, which they absolutely detest, and they think, "Oh, we should never have d- 
tried rock songs we were never any good at that but we wanted to try we wanted to see if we could make it work and it was just a waste of time so there are a number of songs like that what do you think abba's legacy will be um just well crafted music i think i think the message of abba's music for all the melancholy for all the divorce lyrics for all the all that I think the message is that music has a worth in itself. You know, we have other artists who are much better at uh, singing about politics or going in depth, going being introspective. For ABBA, the message is message is that uh, music has a worth in itself. Celebration of music has a worth in itself. Carl Magnus Palm, who's written a book revealing ABBA's recording secrets. You've got the pictures as well. Turn hand and sit. Uh, uh, Sally singing into a hairbrush. Now then, we all like a bit of ABBA, don't we? This week, by the way, 40 years of the start of ABBA's five-week run at number one with Knowing Me, Knowing You. Some people back then, and even some to this day, have dismissed them as nothing more than Eurovision winners. But then, they sort of took over. And they took over the industry, and their songs have become loved and cherished. There's there's a depth, a complexity to the construction of their music. Uh, and one man who is very fascinated by ABBA is Carl Magnus Palm. And through his research and interviews with the band, he's written a book which reveals ABBA's recording secrets. I caught up with him earlier this week. We've grown up, we've grown old with their music. So I asked Carl, what makes that music so special? I think I think it's just the the, the pure craftsman craftsmanship of it that they were they took such great care with their music. They um, uh, you know they paid attention to detail to say the least. So they were perfectionists in that in that sense. But then. There was there was also strong emotional content in there, and the and uh, the girls, uh, you know, their vocals when they did those, they you know they put they put their heart and soul in it, and that's what you know it sort of reaches us through through the decades, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's still very powerful. Yeah, and and like you say, I think you summed it up when you said it was beautifully crafted, and and yet when you look at the back catalogue. It's such a range of styles as well, and, and all of them sophisticated, all of them hit the mark. They do, yeah. It's it's incredible. I think that that, that was a, a point of pride for them, that they wanted to... They try to emulate the Beatles in that mm. sense, in the, in that they tried to make albums that had, you know, a ballad, a, a rocker, a novelty track, a, a this, a that, a disco number. So, so there was always something happening, and and they saw that I think as a challenge to try to master all these different styles. Because of that, I and mean, because of the craft and the skill they employed, I suppose it, it's it's almost future proof them, hasn't it? They've never really gone out of fashion. No, I, I think there was a time in the in the 1980s when there was a bit of a dip, mm. um, uh, when sort of they were sort of forgotten, and they were their music was released on these cheap looking compilations, and no one really cared. Mm. Uh, but then obviously they came back with a vengeance in the early 90s, and and they've never been away since then. I suppose it's no surprise that the two men wrote a musical because they had that in them, didn't they? they, they, they like you say, the way that their their very musicality uh, it probably lends itself to that. Oh, certainly. And you know, the the funny thing is that let's say halfway through the ABBA career or something, that's when they started, you know, they said in interviews, yeah, oh, we'd really like to write a musical one day, and maybe maybe our next project will be um, a musical, but we'll see. And then they couldn't think of a good idea, or, you know, they, they sort of, ah, let's, let's just make another ABBA album. So that, that musical was always there to be written, and it wasn't until they got together with Tim Rice in, uh, in the early 80s that they found someone they could work with and then that became the musical chess of course and and the dynamic of those two men um uh, not just in, in terms of songwriting in their professionalism and their skill but also their solidarity as well i remember watching a documentary years ago about how they stood by each other even through the lean times early on he said no we we come as a partnership 
Yeah, that's very true. You know, their manager, Stig Anderson, uh, his partner in his record company died. Who he And that guy, he, he was the producer. And because he'd sort of been grooming Bjorn, he said to Bjorn, you know, I'd like you to come on board. I'd like to hire you as the house producer on my record company. And, and Bjorn said, well, you know, I'd love to do that, but only if you take Benny as well. Mm. And then Stig said, well, you know, I can only afford the salary for one person. Well, okay, we take half the salary each then. So that hey, speaks volumes, about, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it does. And they've always had this fifty-fifty partnership, and they've never, they've never had these arguments. Oh, oh, I'm doing more than you, and you're doing a bit less. I should have more money than you. They never had those discussions, and that's why uh, their partnership has survived over the decades. I mean, your book it, it uncovers the recording secrets, but also. How, how they went about, set about things, and how they feel about those recording sessions now. So what secrets can you tell us to whet our appetite, Carl? Well, I found some really interesting stuff when I listened to alternate mixes, and, you know, you could sort of trace the, uh, the evolution of one and the same song. I mean, take Dancing Queen, for instance. You, you, when you listen to it today, it sounds so self-evident. It's like, wow, this is a perfect package, and it must have been like this from the start, right? But, but as you listen to all these things, you can hear how it developed, and they worked on it over the, uh, several months. And the the thing that I found most fascinating was, you know, that distinctive piano in Dancing Queen, da -dum, sure. da -dum, da -dum, which you think is like the defining mm. mark of Dancing Queen. That was only added at the last minute. Oh. It was a last minute addition. You think you know? it's so in they, its DNA, and yet it's just an add-on. Exactly, exactly. So so they they would never give up until they were completely happy about it probably explains why they're still so popular and, and we are still fascinated by them. Carl, it's been a pleasure. Thanks very much for your time. My pleasure. Thank you. to make a quick confession now because if you listen to me many years ago when I was on Piccadilly Radio in the 80s and onwards I had a jingle which consisted of a mate of mine shouting have you got any Abba Sweeney in a very northern voice and I used to make some disparaging comment about Abba and of course times have changed people mellow attitudes change it's interesting though when you think that Abba uh, have been part of the chart scene now for over 40 years here in the UK. Uh, and they've, they, they seem to be reevaluated upwards all the time now. And a mystique has, uh, almost arrived around the band. Uh, one man who has been fascinated by ABBA is Carl Magnus Palmer. He wrote a book, uh, a book in the mid nineties featuring interviews with the band. Now he's updated that book for 2017, but, and this is amazing, was invited by Benny and Bjorn to listen to the previously unreleased ABBA songbook. So the mo the book's out now called ABBA, The Complete Recording Sessions. Carl joins me as well. Carl, good morning. Good morning to you. And isn't it interesting, we, we have had this uh, Damascene conversion where ABBA are concerned and, and they're now, you know, held with great respect. But they were seen, weren't they, very much as a bubblegum pop group getting back to the 70s, maybe. They were indeed, yeah. Uh, I think what what people missed out on, uh, you know, back then was that they they took their bubble gum very seriously, if you will. <laughs> they they worked for for weeks on one of the uh, one and the same song. So you know, from a production point of view, from a songwriting point of view, uh, those songs are pretty much flawless. Why do you think that they came back to you at this moment in time after 2017, the two guys, to say, look? We trust you, Carl. Come and have a listen to this uh, and see what you think. Well, it was more like I, I came back to them and said that, you know, because back, back in the 90s, everything was in an analogue format, you know, with reel-to-reel -reel tapes and stuff like that, and you had to hire a recording studio if you wanted to listen to that. But since then, they the record company has had everything transferred to digital, and they're all on reference discs, so you just have to pop a CD into a CD player and you can listen to it and cost nothing. So I asked them, you know, you know, I said this. Look, uh, this book I did back in the 90s, and which you collaborated on, um, 
I'd like to update that if possible. Um, would you authorize me to to listen to all these alternate mixes and stuff? And and they said yes. Uh, Is there uh, anything there that that you were particularly pleasantly surprised by when you were listening? Um, it's hard to say because there were so many things. But but I was I was startled at some of the discoveries. You, you, uh, I mean, take a song like Dancing Queen, for instance, which we all know, and, you know, we, we you could think that that was like a perfect package from, from the moment they recorded it, but they, they worked for months on that, and, you know, that uh, significant piano thing, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, you think that's an, like an essential part of Dancing Queen. Well, that was only added at the last stage. They'd done so many mixes of that song, and they tried this, and they tried that. And that jubilant piano, which is like, you know, uh, such an important part of Dancing Queen, it's like one of the identifiers, if you will, that was only added as, a, as an afterthought, almost. I, um, I looked at a survey, I think it was last year, and it was, uh, it was putting forward who or what would be the most lucrative um, re reformation of any uh, rock and roll act, uh, whether they were with us or not, and Led Zeppelin were, were, were up there, uh, but really, right up there in the top five were ABBA uh, as, as the act that most people would actually like to see back together, and the, obviously this massive amount of, um, of affection around the band. Why do you think that is? Um, I think maybe part of it is that, you know, because they, they haven't come back, they haven't come back to spoil the memory. Uh, if you want to, if you think of ABBA, you will always think of them as they were back in the 70s. So there's this tension between um, the love of, for the music and the fact that they refuse to to get back together again. And of course, the music has stood the test of time, and I think also because some people felt, oh, I shouldn't really like this music, it's so superficial, it's, it's just a pop, and they don't sing about anything serious. They may have felt like that back at the time, and now when when there's sort of there's the, all this love for ABBA, maybe people feel sort of vindicated, yeah, I was right all along. And yeah. I know when we first saw the band, when, and I remember them doing uh, Waterloo or the Eurovision in the 70s and and I think at first what we thought was it, it was two uh, attractive girls singing the songs written by two guys and you, and you think of, of, of the dynamic of the band being like that I think over the years we've realised that you've got four very strong individuals and two very strong women uh, and two very strong guys so I would imagine that, that they've not always agreed on everything what's your take on that? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, because they were four very stubborn individuals who knew what they wanted. It wasn't always smooth sailing, uh, for sure, so it, it created tension in the recording studio and, um, you know, uh, everywhere. But I think they felt that, you know, that that's only good. There should be a, a, a bit of fire in the studio. That's only good for the track, uh, that you get a bit of extra energy when there's, you know, some kind of uh, anger in there or whatever. Well, I'm looking forward to the book. That's Carl Magnus Palm. Carl's book now is called ABBA, The Complete Recording Sessions, uh, out now, uh, first written in the 90s, and I have to say, it's one of those interviews, and thank you so much, Carl, that I could have spent 30 minutes talking to Carl, and there was so much I wanted to do in so many places, I had to go, but only so many minutes to do it in. Now this, this is a tune. It's Dolby Gray. Love Abba. And who doesn't? Well, got a good excuse this week because it's the 40th anniversary of the start of Abba's five-week run at number one with Knowing Me, Knowing You. Now, one man who's been fascinated by Abba is a chap called Carl Magnus Palm, and through his research and interviews with the band, he's written a fabulous book which reveals Abba's recording secrets, and Carl joins us this morning. Uh, Carl, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. How are you? I'm very well. Now, how, how did you first get into uh, into the group? When did you first discover Abba yourself? Well, obviously, growing up in the 70s uh, and in Sweden, uh, I couldn't really avoid them because they're from <laughs> Sweden. And so, you know, they, they were they were around. I wasn't a big fan at the time, to be, to be quite honest. Um, so it was mainly, well, it was like the early 90s when I really started getting into them and started doing all this research in the, into their recording career and stuff. 
I mean, this is quite a book as well. So what made you decide to write the book in the first place? Was it something about the songs? Was it about the band themselves, the chemistry? Yeah, I mean, I'd written, or sorry, I'd read uh, similar books about the Beatles that really mm. uh, went in depth on, on how their music was put together by Mark Lewison, who's obviously like the world's number one Beatles expert and he'd written a, a book called The Complete Beatles Recording Sessions, which I loved. And I thought I'd like to do something like that. And uh, that coincided with me getting into it. And I thought, well, well, you know, everybody loves their music. Everybody, even the people who don't like their music will acknowledge the craftsmanship that mm. That, that they knew what they were doing, and yet there was nothing written about it. Written about it, and I thought, okay, here's a challenge for me, it's something to get into. How close did you get to the inner workings of Abba? Then you, you know them personally. Well, I, you could say I know the guys personally a bit, but I, I, it's not like I hang out with them because I study ABBA so much. I, I try to leave them alone uh, <laughs> and only contact them, you know, when I really need to to uh, have their input on something. Mm. I know they they're all behind the book as well, though, aren't they? Yeah, they they uh, they endorsed it, you know, because this is a revised and expanded edition of a, of a book that I originally did in in, in the nineties. It's, it's like three or t three or four times as much text in this really? version. That yeah, so uh, you know, at the time there, I talked to or I interviewed all four of them at the time. And they were really happy to to help me with this, and uh, they were happy that people that someone was wanted to talk about their music and their creativity rather than the divorces and stuff, which is fascinating, obviously. But you mm. know, this was music only. I mean, you, you got to listen as well to some of the unreleased material, so they must have really trusted you. Well, what what was the unreleased material like? Was it was it was it okay? Was it? Do you think they missed out on a couple of hits? Yeah, there there are a few songs in there which I think that if they'd worked, if they hadn't stopped working on them, and if they worked worked more on them, maybe edited them down and added few few things, they could have been you know big hits or at really at least really great album tracks. But that's ABBA for you. They threw away things that other people would have kept. <laughs> their 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 quality control was consistently very high. Mm. Are the ABBA members always very positive about the music? I mean, did, did they embrace everything they done? They don't. You know, this compilation album, ABBA Gold, which is such a huge success, it's the second best-selling album of all time in this country, for instance. Mm. Well, Bjorn and Benny, they keep telling the record company that they should put out an album called ABBA Wood with, uh, with the worst ABBA tracks. Uh, <laughs> and there are a few there, uh, especially the early ones, like on the Waterloo album, there's a rock song called Watch Out, which they absolutely detest. Really? Uh, and they, they always... They always felt, you know, we were never any good at doing rock songs, and yet we tried so many times. We should never have done that. There's another one called King Kong Song, which they don't like. Hey, Hey, Helen is another. Um, and actually, it's even some of the later tracks, like Gimme, 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 for instance, uh, Benny says that the the intro bit you know that uh, which madonna sampled later he says that's the only good bit in on that song you know he he you know the rest he think is crap more or less really? so that's fascinating i definitely like more abba songs than they do <laughs> i mean knowing me knowing you that's my favorite type of track i love it i think yeah. it's fabulously put together yeah, I couldn't agree more. And that's that's also an example. That track was much longer uh, f to, to start with. So really? they edited out bits. Yeah, there's a long, long intro that goes on forever, which they sort of cut in half if, if that's not... I mean, I mean they even may even have cut more <laughs> off it than, uh, uh, <laughs> just to make it more captivating. Okay, they always felt, okay, this bit is boring. It's just, you know, we're treading water here. here. Let's... Let's pull it out. Let's yank it out to make it more captivating, to make it more efficient. You know. Wow. So this is this is the most hard for any ABBA fan, isn't it? Because this this is not only about the music, it, it, as we're talking now, about the music that they didn't think so much of. It's about the engineers who worked on the albums and the tracks. It, it this is the big book, isn't it? 
Yeah, I'd like to think so. This is like the go-to book if you if you want if you want to know everything about Abbas music and how they worked. And also, it's not it's not just all these details about technical stuff. Mm. It's it's a human story as well because you you get to to understand how they felt, how they thought, how they approached it emotionally. So, if I've done my job right, and I, I'd like to think I have, well, sure <laughs> people you have. people people who are interested in Abbas music will will enjoy this book for sure. Because this has been a labour of love. How many years do you think it's taken all told to put it together? Oh God, two or three years. Really? At least, yeah. I've worked seven days a week on this new edition, seven days a week for two years without, you know, with, with only a few days off for a holiday here and there. So it's been a labour of love for sure. Fantastic. Listen, thank you so much for your time today and good luck with the book. It's called ABBA, The Complete Recording Sessions by Carl Magnus Palm, available at all good book stockers. Thank you so much for today, Carl. Thank you. Great to talk to you and good luck with it. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>